Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday, where we investigate disasters at sea and the impact that they have on the world today. My name is Eleanor, and here with me is my co-host, Derek. Hello. Today we will be exploring the disappearance and alleged sinking of the White Star Liner SS Neuronic. Before we dive in, we must inform you. The story does include details of a maritime disaster resulting in the alleged sinking of a vessel and discussion of death that may be disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Please note before we begin that neither Eleanor nor I are mariners or experts in the field of maritime history, but we have done our research and will present the information as we understand it and with accurate nautical terminology. In today's episode, we are going off of the minimal amount of information that is available about SS Neuronic, so there may be some gray areas in today's story that we will be transparent about. Before we get started, we will go over the basics of nautical terminology. The bow is the very front part of the ship, and the very back end of it is called the stern. The port side is the left, and the starboard side is the right. Propellers are sometimes referred to as screws. The hull is the metal side of the ship. The keel is the very bottom of it, and the superstructure is the top deck, usually made of wood. Smokestacks, or funnels, are large tunnels on top of the ship used to direct steam and smoke away from the deck. Masts are large wooden poles on the deck of the ship, usually used to hoist sails or hold a crow's nest where crew members can see for miles around the vessel. Beam is a measurement that refers to the width of the ship. Thank you, Derek. In today's story, we will start at the beginning of the White Star Line as a shipping company and work our way forward to the birth and death of the SS Neuronic. The White Star Line was a British shipping company that was founded out of the remains of a packet company that eventually took the world by storm as one of the most prominent transatlantic shipping lines in the world and became especially notorious for the many tragedies at sea that happened in their existence as a company. Early on, the company focused on the cargo trade between the United Kingdom and Australia from the years 1845 to 1868. The company initially struggled to turn a profit with losses of chartered ships and deaths that caused several inquiries and lawsuits against the parent company at the time, Charles Moore and Company. In 1856, the young White Star Line continued to bleed money as they lost multiple postal contracts while the owners insisted on building larger and more expensive ships. The disparity in the profit and debts only grew, made worse by ego and overzealous business practices that led to the White Star Line filing for bankruptcy in 1867 with a debt of 527,000 euro, which is approximately 57 million 200,000 euro in 2019. Luckily, one man swooped in to save the day for White Star Line and made her into the incredible shipping company we knew her to have been. On January 18, 1868, a director for the National Line, Thomas Ismay, purchased the bankrupted White Star Line for roughly 1,000 pounds, roughly 102,900 pounds in 2019, and laid out his plan to turn the shipping line around. White Star Line would have become a company that would operate many steamships across the Atlantic between Liverpool and New York City, similar to their future rival Cunard. Ismay was approached at the company's newly established headquarters in Liverpool by merchant Gustav Christian Schwab and shipbuilder Gustav Wilhelm Wolf during a game of billiards. While sinking pool balls into pockets, Wolf made an offer Ismay couldn't resist. Schwab would finance a new line if Ismay assured all of the line's new ships would be built by Wolf's company Harlan & Wolf. Ismay readily agreed and a lasting partnership between the two companies was established. The first transatlantic services established by Ismay's White Star Line were run between Liverpool and New York City with six nearly identical ships called the Oceanic class, Oceanic, Atlantic, Baltic, Republic, Celtic, and Adriatic. These ships were the first to use the iconic suffix used by White Star Line ships of their names ending in IC. The first of the Oceanic class was launched in 1870, with each ship being identical at 420 feet in length and a 40-foot beam and weighing at approximately 3,707 gross registered tons. Equipped with compound expansion engines powering a single screw and donning four masts hoisted with square-rigged sails for added assurance, these liners could achieve speeds of up to 14 knots, around 16 miles per hour. They also provided the same passenger accommodations, offering the two-class system that was popular on ships during the time, 
up to 1,000 steerage class passengers and 166 saloon class. Steerage class was the equivalent of third class accommodations and generally was housed on the lower decks. They were given the most basic commodities and the class was split into three sections of passengers, the single women and children, families, and single men. Oftentimes, single men and single women were kept on two opposite sides of the ship, with the families in the middle, so the men of the families would protect the single women from harassment. The single men would be housed on the other end of the ship near the engineers and other crew, so they would also keep the particularly rowdy single men at bay. The saloon class, or first class passengers, had much more lavish accommodations amidships. Their beautiful dining hall was set up saloon style with long tables complete with swiveling stools decked out in the fine woods and fabrics. Although White Star Line had built six beautiful ocean liners, success was not immediate. Oceanic's maiden voyage only saw her carry 64 people to New York City and was riddled with mechanical issues and stops for repairs. However, once she arrived in the Big Apple, a crowd of 50,000 was waiting to greet her and look over the grand ship, making her return voyage much more profitable. Oceanic's youngest sister ship, the Adriatic, ended up earning the Revered Blue Ribbon, the award given to the ship with fastest Atlantic crossing in May of 1872. The six sisters made their mark on history quickly, until a dark stain would begin to tarnish White Star Line's reputation, years before the sinking of RMS Titanic. The first substantial loss for White Star Line, and unfortunately the biggest disaster at sea at that point in history, was the sinking of RMS Atlantic near Halifax, Nova Scotia. An estimated 585 of the 952 passengers on board perished, marking the first time White Star Line would lose a liner, but definitely not the last. We will cover this shipwreck in a later episode, but for now let's move on to the real star of today's episode, the SS Neuronic. SS Neuronic was a cargo ship built for White Star Line by Harland and Wolfe in Belfast, Ireland in 1892. Her keel was laid in yard number 251, and she ended up being the largest cargo ship on the sea at the time, at 470 feet in length and a 53-foot beam, weighing in at 6,594 gross registered tons. She had three decks, twin reciprocating steam engines, and was a twin screw, able to achieve speeds of up to 13 knots. She was the sister ship of the other cargo liner at the SS Bovic, and was at the time when the White Star Line wanted to capitalize on the transport and sale of live cattle on the Northern Atlantic route. Manned by a 50-man crew, she was expected to transport cattle from the United States and other goods across the Atlantic between Liverpool and New York City. She also had a few spacious cabins that would carry a few passengers for a lower price than most of the passenger ships at the day. SS Neuronic was launched on May 26th of 1892, and after sea trials and additional modifications, was deemed completed on July 11th of that year. Her maiden voyage was four days later on July 15th, 1892, and was successful by all accounts. In November of 1892, Neuronic's Captain Thompson was replaced by the captain of the Adriatic, Captain William Roberts. The ship dutifully carried passengers and cargo across the Atlantic in 1892, only running into one incident of that year, shortly after Captain Roberts took the con. On November 27, 1892, despite having ideal conditions for the transport of livestock, SS Neuronic arrived in Liverpool, having lost 34 cattle during the journey across the Atlantic. There is no known cause for why these cattle were lost, although I assume it could be due to the stress the animals may have felt while crossing the occasionally rough Atlantic Ocean. And now we arrive at the mystery of the SS Neuronic. Just a reminder to everyone, this episode does contain details of a potential sinking and death that may be disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised as we continue. Thanks, Eleanor. On February 11, 1893, SS Neuronic left the port of Liverpool with 60 crew, 14 passengers, and 2,876 tons of goods. As she was leaving Liverpool, there were no cattle aboard yet, but the ship did carry two horses as well as several cages of live pigeons and chickens. On board in her coal reserves, SS Neuronic had enough coal to make the round trip between Liverpool and New York City, where she would carry back cattle to Europe. The ship made her final stop before her crossing in Anglesey, North Wales, at Point Linus to put her pilot, or the crew member that is in charge of coastal navigation, back ashore. 
After the pilot was dropped off, SS Neuronic headed out into heavy seas and was never seen again. Now, the general consensus based upon the evidence we are about to present is that SS Neuronic hit an iceberg and sank in the North Atlantic, taking all 74 on board down with her. However, I'm not totally convinced. Why not? Well, here's the story. The passage of the SS Neuronic was supposed to be 10 days at sea, arriving in New York on the 21st of February, 1893. The 21st of February came and went, and she didn't arrive. Although delays were very common at the time, and no one was immediately worried due to the fact that Marconi Wireless was not yet installed on ships. Marconi Wireless, for anyone not familiar, is the Morse code devices that were used on ships like Titanic in order to communicate with other ships nearby, and would not be used on ships until 1899, and would not be a commonplace on ships until 1901. On March 1, 1893, White Star Line said there was no cause for concern as people began to wonder where the cargo liner was. A reporter got a statement from them one week later, where it was stated that, quote, They think she's afloat and have every reason to hope she's safe. They stress that the ship is recent, built with watertight compartments, well-equipped, handled and commanded by the best officers in the Atlantic. Despite these statements, it's probable that White Star Line was concerned it was just displaying overconfidence in their design of ships, a trait that would surely come back to haunt them in 1912. By March 13, 1893, it had been too long. SS Neuronic would surely, if she was still somehow sailing the seas, have run out of coal by now. The company was quoted saying, There is now great concern about the ship. On March 14, a fellow White Star cargo ship, the Tuareg, arrived in New York City. The additional lookouts had been posted to keep an eye out for signs of the SS Neuronic at sea had seen nothing. No bodies, no debris, and no lifeboats. The next day, the captain of the luxurious White Star Liner, passenger liner RMS Teutonic, arrived in New York City, stating he diverted his course south in order to find Neuronic, but had not seen her. Having received confirmation that SS Neuronic was also not in the Azores, an archipelago in Portugal where ships sometimes found themselves, White Star Line was quoted as saying this on March 15th. We will still hope that it can be safe, but it is unlikely that it will be found, because the Atlantic is crisscrossed by steamers and sailboat, and it would certainly have been spotted if it had still been afloat. Well, that's certainly a positive outlook. The Atlantic Ocean is a large body of water, so making such a statement, although probably true, is quite negative. Agreed. After this statement was made, Rumors began circulating in the press about the ship. According to these rumors, the ship was carrying a vast number of immigrants that could be blamed for the potential sinking, which White Star Line swiftly denied the culpability of their passengers. The most optimistic of the rumors was the potential of the liner running out of coal and was forced to drift at sea, possibly still floating around the Atlantic somewhere, and thanks to the ship carrying chickens and pigeons, the passengers and crew aboard would have months' worth of provisions. On March 19, 1893, some new information came to light about SS Neuronic. On March 19, 1893, some new information came to light about SS Neuronic. British steamer SS Coventry reported seeing two of SS Neuronic's empty lifeboats approximately 500 miles east of Halifax, Nova Scotia, where 20 years before the RMS Atlantic had sunk. The first of these alleged lifeboats was spotted around 2 a.m. on March 4th and was found capsized, and the second, found around 2 p.m. of the same day, was found completely swamped with water. Neither held the bodies of passengers or crew. With the state of the lifeboats in such disarray, it was assumed that Neuronic had sunk quickly with not much time to prepare the lifeboats. In the months following her disappearance, four messages in bottles, allegedly written by members of the crew of the SS Neuronic, were recovered on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. With these messages came an avalanche of questions, hoaxes, and rumors about the stricken liner, but the authenticity of these messages was doubtful, much like the speculation at the time. The American press theorized that SS Neuronic could have been sabotaged with explosives as was later found on the Torek, although later investigations found that the explosives on Torek were merely fireworks. This story just gets weirder and weirder. 
In June of 1893, a commission of inquiry was convened to try to determine the cause of the loss of SS Neuronic. The commission thwarted a theory that the ship sank due to faulty boilers, as they had been found to have been installed properly and were of the highest quality available. Other rumors swirled were that the ship had capsized after being caught in a storm, which was possible. Ships at the time were known to roll and be unstable in heavy seas, which Neuronic had set out in. However, Captain Thompson of the SS Bovik, who had previously captained Neuronic, stated that even in heavy storms, Neuronic had proven herself a stable and seaworthy ship, so it was unlikely she capsized. He also determined her course would have taken her well past the south of Newfoundland, over 100 miles south of the nearest ice. This conclusion was questioned, however, since according to the New York press, there had been reports from several ships of ice in the areas near SS Neuronic's disappearance. Ironically, this is also the same area where RMS Titanic would later sink due to a collision with an iceberg, so there was the definite possibility of icebergs being in that area. For this reason, the commission was led to the conclusion of the sinking being due to ice. According to the four messages in bottles, SS Neuronic struck an iceberg in the North Atlantic and sank over the course of two hours. The second bottled message recovered from the River Mercy on September 18th of 1893 was the most detailed, stating, 3.10 a.m. February 19th, SS Neuronic at sea. To who picks this up? Report when you find this to our agents, if not heard of before, that our ship is sinking fast beneath the waves. It is such a storm that we can never live in the small boats. One boat has already gone with her human cargo below. God let all of us live through this. We are struck by an iceberg in a blinding snowstorm and floated two hours. Now it's 3.20 a.m. by my watch and the great ship is dead level with the sea. Report to the agents at Broadway, New York, M. Kersey and Company. Goodbye, all. It was signed, John Olson Cattleman. However, strangely, no one by that name was listed on the ship's manifest. The closest being either John O'Hara or John Watson. A similar situation happened with another bottled message naming a man by the name L. Winsel, who was also not in the ship's manifest. The other two messages in bottles are unsigned. Because of this, the reliability of these messages was deemed questionable at best and determined ingenuine by the commission. If the messages in the bottles are somehow true, then the ship sank sometime after 3.20 a.m. on February 19, 1893. So with all of this compelling evidence of the ship having sank due to ice, why aren't you completely convinced, Eleanor? Well, Derek, to put it simply, it just seems too easy for this to have happened by iceberg. However, I must admit this is more than likely the truth of the matter based upon logic, the later sinking of Titanic in the area, and the facts of the sinking as we know it. It just doesn't make sense to me that there, that no debris other than a few lifeboats and potentially faked messages and bottles were the only things that turned up. For example, after RMS Titanic sank, bodies and debris were recovered from the ocean and shores of Newfoundland for months afterward. If SS Neuronic sank in the same area, where was the debris floating on the water like we saw with Titanic? Where were the bodies of her passengers and crew? Especially if her sinking was as hasty as the discovery of her lifeboats had led SS Coventry to believe, then there definitely would have been something more than two lifeboats to reveal the secrets of SS Neuronic's disappearance and alleged sinking. I also found it interesting that in March of 1893, it was found that her, included in her cargo holds were several chemicals including acids, potassium chlorate, sodium sulfide, and calcium hypochlorate in which under certain conditions an explosion would have happened. These conditions would have to have been created by a storm tossing these items around the hold. Two historians at the time, John P. Eaton and Charles A. Hawes, drew this conclusion and with this later reported testimony in October of 1893 from a Norwegian ship known as the Emblem, finding one of Neuronic's lifeboats capsized and covered in barnacles in July. It supported the theory of a hasty sinking like that of an explosion rather than the slow death of a ship provided by icebergs. An explosion would have made more debris to be found than just hastily thrown out lifeboats, however. For these reasons, I have my doubts and many unanswered questions about the explosion theory. The explosion theory has never been proven, and neither has that of an iceberg, 
although an iceberg is more likely than a chemical explosion to have sunk the cargo ship with the reports of ice being in the area and with another liner suffering the same fate 19 years later. So where does the sinking of SS Neuronic leave us? Aside from the thousands of unanswered questions we have, we don't have much else. The lifeboats are no longer in existence, the wreckage has never been found, and the mysterious messages and bottles were also lost to time. That leaves the public to have to draw their own conclusion about SS Neuronic. She was the largest cargo ship at the time, and more than likely sank in not only one of the most dangerous oceans in the world, but one of the most dangerous parts of that ocean, where we do know another White Star Liner sank, further cementing White Star Line's scandalous reputation in history for losing so many vessels. Her loss cost the lives of 74 people, as well as a huge net loss for White Star Line, who had failed to insure the 122,000 euro vessel. They eventually replaced it with the cattle transporter Sevic in 1894, which was much larger than her sister the Georgic in 1895. Insurers had to reimburse White Star Line for the cargo, which was valued at roughly 62,000 euro. However, the worst loss in this tragedy was the 74 lives of SS Neuronic took with her, with wives of the two of these crew members having to be institutionalized due to the trauma of losing their husbands. Unfortunately, for the families of the lost and for later historians, there is not much left of SS Neuronic other than theories and speculation. Well, what we can draw from this deep dive is that SS Neuronic, like many of the ships at the time, including a ship we previously talked about, SS La Brigone, would have greatly benefited from the later usage of Marconi wireless systems on ships. If Neuronic had been able to call for help, she might have been saved, or by the very least we may have a conclusion to her story. Luckily, ships today benefit from having great 24-hour communications with both other ships and the shore, as well as a radar, GPS navigation, and continually updated safety regulations. SS Neuronic is unfortunately going to forever be a mystery of the Atlantic Ocean, unless her wreckage is discovered and we can discern any amount of truth from it. Hopefully this podcast episode can pay some sort of tribute to the many lost in the wake of this tragedy, and to keep the memory of SS Neuronic and her crew and passengers alive. Thank you for tuning in to Shipwreck Sunday. If you liked this episode and are listening on YouTube, please give us a like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel. If you liked this episode and are listening on Spotify, Samsung Podcast, Amazon Music, or another podcast service, please subscribe for more content and leave us a five-star review, as it does help us reach more listeners like you. Tune in next Sunday for the story of PT-109, the patrol torpedo boat that was manned by a former U.S. president and sank in the Pacific Ocean during World War II. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Happy Mother's Day.